welcome back to anyone who was uh, with us last week and uh, welcome to any new faces. Uh, we'll give you a, a quick recap of what we were talking about last week, um, but not in great detail. But as a quick introduction, um, for those who are new, once again, that's who I am. And the key reason that I'm presenting this this evening is because I wrote the Field Studies Council uh, Field Study Council Guide to Harvestment of the British Isles, the fold-out chart. So, actually, course text, I guess, uh, if there's such a thing. Um, but there'll be a whole host of other things that uh, other resources which can help identify harvestment for you, which we'll discuss later. So that's what we talked about last week. Now, so it was a very general introduction to harvestment why on earth they're called harvestmen, what sort of general life history they have, uh, how to collect them, and uh, a bit about key resources that you might use. I'll repeat some of that for you today uh, so that uh, some of the basics are on this. So it's sort of a, still a standalone presentation for um, if this is the point at which you're joining us. Um, but if you want more information, um, obviously, go to the YouTube site uh, for the Tanipra project and the Pog One Harvestman can be found there alongside um, the previous webinars that I've presented. So um, if anything, if you, if you feel that there's something uh, lacking or some information that, that's, that's missed, it's possibly in part one. And then of course there's part three next week where we'll look at these slightly trickier things to identify not that any of them are very difficult to do so there we are so last week's can be found there so very rapid recap before we get on to looking at um, almost entirely just about identifying British species this week and certainly the the more straightforward ones so um as I should I could, of course, do this in a very interactive way and ask lots of questions of the audience who were here, but we'll, uh, we won't go through that. Um, I'll just tell you once again that they are arachnids, uh, harvestmen, eight-legged arachnids, but they are not spiders. As you may recall last week, and I showed uh, a similar slide at this point, um, each of the ones I showed had four legs or seven legs and they weren't eight-legged. So they should have eight but they do readily detach a limb as a defense mechanism. Um, so um, they may not necessarily have eight legs, but they are um, closely related to the spiders and the scorpions and the pseudoscorpions and the mites. They sit uh, within uh, the order uh, Opiliones um, and within the British fauna, we only really have uh, a few uh, representatives from suborders, um, the Dyspnoi and the Eupnoi, which are sometimes gathered together under the uh, sort of broader title of Palpatores. And uh, recently there's, there's a species belonging to the Laniatores, which has been found in Britain. So uh, a limited uh, range of species, um, but um, quite a, a, vari a variety of, of forms and, and behaviours. Uh, nonetheless. So as we were talking last week about why on earth you might look at them, they are really relatively easy in terms of uh, as, as invertebrates go in this country. Only 33 to uh, recognise and uh, you, you can probably actually learn 33 uh, almost, almost off the top of your head. Um, and also they're not the sort of uh, species the way you see more if you live in Devon and, and, and Surrey. Um, you actually, they're quite widespread. Uh, so depending on where you live, you might get quite a, a good range of harvestmen. Sheffield's a very good place to see harvestmen. Um, some which are not entirely unique here anymore, but um, um, quite a good range. So you don't have to just live in the South Coast. Uh, and if you're in the north of Scotland, um, the species there, which are almost unique to that area too. So wherever you are, um, um, there's, a, there's a lot of things to look at. 26, give or take, I would say are pretty distinctive. And you might even say that 
you know, you could almost identify them on almost one character, um, but that's pos possibly um, pushing it a bit. But with some familiarity, you're only really looking for one or two features to identify them. There may be perhaps seven or more um, which need a little bit more uh, attention, but not really, uh, not really very difficult. So next week we'll look at uh, some of the slightly more uh, complicated things. And today, as I say, hopefully you'll go away being able to recognise a, a good proportion of the British species when you encounter them. Uh, the other great advantage is they're not only relatively easy to identify, but they're also very easy to find, in that some will just be sitting on a wall, uh, just waiting for you to walk past and notice them. Uh, others take a little bit more searching through leaf litter, turning over stones and logs, but generally speaking, they're around uh, most places, um, very easy to find throughout the year. So there are always adults of one sort or another at all times of year. So uh, a good group to get people interested in, in invertebrates. Um, so if you're, if you're actually in, in the business of perhaps uh, teaching or, or just trying to engage um, new people into natural history and particularly sort of swing them away from the vertebrates into the invertebrate world, harvestmen are a really good route to do that. So as I say, um, a lot of what um, I'm talking about is summarised in the field guide that the Field Studies Council produced. This is now out of print and I'm working on a new edition. So uh, there, are, there are at least six species in Britain now which have, have been found subsequent to this being published. So um, there will be, there'll be different images and things, so they probably work quite well together. But there is another one on its way um, when, when we can get that organised. The idea, generally speaking, is that um, this is a, just a, a colour guide to augment the, the more uh, perhaps technical um, Linnaean Society synopsis um, or, or whatever the field guide that you might be using with, with a bit more detail in it. But this offers some pretty pictures and because they are relatively easy to identify from one or two characters, a, a picture's often all you need. Um, in the, uh, on the back, there's a chart and the chart highlights just the one or two. In this case, it's highlighted in blue, um, one or two key things to note, which will really pinpoint what you're looking at. So I'm going to do that today with a lot of pictures and I will pinpoint the diagnostic characteristics that you really want to be looking at. As I say, maybe one or two characters and, and you know what the thing is you're looking at. Um, there are one, uh, others which may require a little bit more uh, information before you can be confident. Um, this is the French key, which um, is um, really, really excellent. It's got lots of photographs in it. Um, but one, uh, one element of it which I really like is that there's a section of uh, species which you can pretty much tell by one or two characters. So exactly what I'm, I'm saying. Um, so it just summarizes basically if it's got a big crown on its head, it's Megabunus diadema. So um, that's a really useful guide if you speak a bit of French, um, but the, the illustrations are, are great. But it's the kind of concept I'm getting at today is that we can uh, identify things on really very few uh, characteristics and we're not dissecting an awful lot of things and, and you can do these things alive. Um, <clears throat> quite a lot of characters can be seen in immatures. Um, so not entirely necessarily from birth, but in some cases you can. Uh, but generally this guide and and all the others really are referring to adults um, at the moment on the facebook group there are a lot of pictures being posted this is not a great time to find adult harvestmen there are a couple of species of note which are around at the moment uh, but a lot of the juveniles do look quite similar so picking up an immature will will cause you some uh, initial problems um, so considering the adults uh, and therefore, 
in the autumn, they tend to be more adults in the populations than there are at the, at the present. Um, but we'll talk about that uh, as we get to them. But it's easy just to get to know one or two of the easy ones to give you some confidence in the film, just to add to your repertoire of invertebrate recording, really, if nothing else. <clears throat> so just uh, to recap again on, on some of the uh, resources that you can use, I'll, I'll make mention of this. The Again, this is Field Studies Council produced Identikit uh, system which is online for free so the the link is here so if you go to to that um, and it just gives you the opportunity to uh, look at a whole range of different characters which i will uh, describe in some detail um shortly and <clears throat> and then various so you can look at the body and and look at different aspects of the body and then it will tell you the most likely uh, species that that could be so um, looking at this particular uh, cr uh, creature, you, you've got the options of a gallery, you've got the options of looking at maps to see if it's likely that that species is near to where you are. And then there's some more detail on there. Um, but I won't go into a lot about that now. I talked about that last week and um, it, it's there on the, uh, on the YouTube channel if you want a bit more information, but more to the point, go to the page and have a play with this because it, it, there's nothing you can do to break it as such. You can put in any information you like, any combination of characters, and you'll see what it does and how it throws up the, the probability to the top of the pile as to which species you may be talking about. If we were doing this face-to-face, uh, -face, if this was a course, excuse me while I block the sun out from my eyes, um, if we were doing this a face-to-face -face course, I would provide you with a large fold-out um, sheet summarising all the characters um, of all the British species. I say there aren't that many of them, so it's, it's reasonably easy to do that. And again, um, this, as you can see, uh, this is an example of that. It's just half of that uh, chart. Unfortunately, you don't get that today, but um, when we can get back to normality and seeing one another in uh, in the flesh and uh, doing these talks over a weekend we'll be able to work through these things uh, a few a few at a time each species and have specimens to look at um, but basically as you can see from there there's there's size of body all very useful and various characteristics along the top but really these red um, highlights in some cases, you can see here, perhaps just knowing that the pedipalps are very long held, folded high up and forwards at right angles in front of the body, that will probably give it away to you without you worrying about all of these other characters uh, at all. So that's, uh, that, that's the way we, the, the system on the back of the fold out chart works. It's, this is a much reduced version of what you can see in front of you there. So, Sorry, you can't get that handout uh, today, um, but come along to a course um, near you whenever one arises, if, we, if, if such a, a future is before us all. Um, and just to remind you what such an event's like, there we are, that's what we'd be doing in the lab with microscopes, pointing at things on walls, but sadly we can't do that. So we do the next best thing and we'll go through the talks and show you lots of pictures. So we'll start with just looking at the anatomy of a harvestman, just to learn when I'm talking about pedipalps, where on earth are they? Um, the various different uh, simple anatomical features. There aren't that many to, to learn. It's not very complicated. We're not learning the different um, structures on the thorax of an ichneumon wasp or, or whatever else. It's, it's, not, it's not a complicated uh, thing to learn. So taking each of these in turn, that's your generic uh, harvestman and if we just look at the top part of the uh, the beast um, we spoke last week about this sort of relatively unique feature the ocularium this turret on top of the head um, that can, that's not necessarily always as obvious as that but there are two eyes and they are one way or another positioned on the fore body at the front of the body on top of the cephalothorax which is the first half 
here, um, which is similar to uh, that of a spider the, the, in terminology, the cephalothorax, the head and the thorax kind of fused together. But there is no waste as there is in the spider. There's this just continued, continuous single bulbous body. And the opisthoma or the abdomen is sort of the back end. So there aren't, there's not necessarily a specific junction to tell you which bit's which, but basically the abdomen's that bit behind the ocularium, really. Um, so you've got this ocularium, two eyes sitting on the top. In front of that, there may be a trident. Uh, trident does imply a three-pronged fork of some description, but that may be a single prong, it may be two pairs, it may be nothing. Um, but the, that point at the front of the, of the um, cephalothorax um, will be referred to as a trident, whether there are three prongs there or not. Uh, on the back, there may be some kind of patterning, which uh, for obvious reasons sometimes uh, distinctly looks like it's a saddle uh, 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 placed on the back. So some kind of pattern on the back will be referred to as a saddle. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll look at that again um, in detail in a moment. So looking at the bottom of the animal, um, in this particular case, I've just drawn in that there's, there's a leg missing there. And, um, but you can see the, the, the coxie, um, the, and, uh, and lots of invertebrates, that first part of the leg where it joins the body is a coxa. And in a harvestman, they're really quite enormous uh, in, in generally. And they're, they usually sort of come together and, and form quite a, quite a uh, the majority of the underside of a harvestman are, are the eight coxy uh, coming together into the center of the, the body. Um, at the very center between where the, the coxy uh, are directed is, is a genital operculum. So there's basically a flap, um, which is sort of, if, you, if you're looking at a specimen and dissecting it, that kind of basically just uh, flips open and the genitalia uh, are inside there. So the genital operculum uh, at, at the center of the body. Uh, beyond that, just a few um, body segments that you can see, um, but, but not much else that is diagnostic and of interest to you today. Um, the next, beyond the coxa, um, the first segment is this small one called a trochanter, which um, is this just this base of the first, usually the longest um, element of the limb, which is the femur. Then we have a little patella, basically it's kneecap, and then a tibia, a metatarsus. And rather than a tarsus, it's got lots of little tarsomeres, and these vary uh, enormously in how many of them there are. Uh, there might just be two or three, but there could be uh, many of them and they're quite prehensile. So they're very good at sort of uh, wrapping round um, and very useful for climbing through foliage. So some of the longer limbed uh, harvestmen with, uh, will have a lot of these tarsomeres and have very flexible ends to their legs and, and can grip onto uh, one another as well as onto vegetation. So um, that's a very sort of standard invertebrate, um, certainly arachnid leg. And at the very end, um, there may be, uh, there'll be some form of claw uh, at, the, at the very end there. But not many of these things are, are needed for identification purposes, but the terminology will crop up. So if we go to the front end of the animal now, so in front of this sort of the cliff edge, if you like, at the front of the cephalothorax where the trident is, that falls away down to where the uh, uh, chelicera are, which are big pincer-like structures, uh, which vary in size. But at the end of those are some pincers, and these are for tearing away at food and actually um, stuffing the, the food into their mouth. So <clears throat> this is a the, the, the uh, chelicerae are, have some quite diagnostic features. So 
On this one, I've just illustrated just the, a spur underneath. So there might be, and that can be quite difficult to see. Um, certainly you wouldn't see it very easily in a live specimen, but even in a, uh, a dead specimen, it tends to be so tucked up against the body that when you're working your way through a key and it talks about the spur under there, um, it might not be that easy to see. So I'm just, I'll warn you of that. Um, much more straightforward, are, are, and sometimes there might be bulges and spines of one sort or another on the uh, chelicera. It might have enormous great big horns sticking out uh, at the top end here, or it might have a little bulge as this one does uh, in one species, Rhylena triangularis. In the male, there's a convenient little um, spine, uh, quite a broad spine at the front of, of the chelicera, um, which um, and you know, I'm alternating between chelicera and chelicera, depending on how you wish to pronounce it. Um, and so there, there'll be all sorts of features on there. A particularly useful character, um, well, um, structure is the pedipalp, or just maybe referred to as a palp. And it, again, it, it'll have sort of a tibia, um, patella, um, femur, descriptor when, when it's describing how the, which particular part of the pedipalp we're referring to. Um, but uh, at the end uh, here, there'll be a little palpal claw. It may, it, that may have little teeth on it, or that may be completely smooth or absent. Um, there may be various bulges uh, at one point or another, particularly on the patella, uh, called an, 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 an ap uh, apophysis. Um, apophyses um, have various different structures and sizes and, and uh, there may also be various tubercles and spines um, that are on the on the femur or, or tibia or wherever. Um, so we'll look at some of this in detail in photographs now to see some of these characteristics in, in, in the flesh, so to speak. But that's it really. There aren't there aren't a great many more. Um, features that you particularly need to pay attention to. So um, it, it's quite straightforward and quite limited areas that we need to look at. And a lot of these things can be seen with the times 10 hand lens. Um, and so the first thing that's perhaps um, noticeable and which you might uh, be looking for a, a, a really key characteristic, maybe on the pedipalps. So these are various different specialized appendages that the, the uh, at the front like uh, like the 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 tenth pair of legs uh, the uh, at the front if you like um, the fifth pair of legs um, they use for all sorts of things so the the pedipalps may um, most obviously be used for uh, prey capture so you've got all these spines and these opposable spines on folding limbs. So clearly if you're catching a, a, a springtail or something, uh, just catching like that with spines in between certainly stops it escaping, even if they're not necessarily killing weapons, um, it, it, it gives it a good grip so that then its chelicery can come into play and start tearing apart uh, it, its prey. So it's good for prey capture, they use then for manipulating food in feeding. They can be used for grooming. Quite often you'll, you'll get a, a harvestman and, and it'll sit there and it will pay a lot of attention to cleaning those tarsomeres and its legs and uh, very fastidious uh, uh, cleaning. And so they'll be grooming themselves with these palps and may even have structures for um, helping to clean. And also, uh, during copulation, we mentioned last week that unlike spiders, where there's sort of sperm packets and complicated courtship uh, rituals, um, harvestmen actually copulate, the male has a penis, and they just um, walk towards each other and copulate. But the uh, pedipalps have some structures which are um, specifically um, designed for holding on. Um, they may be just that they have to be very good for holding on and but they're actually also very good for prey capture um, and it's an incidental um, but in some cases there are specific structures which um, fit very nicely into the first pair of legs of, of the female to hold on to her to stop her running away. 
if you want um, a great paper um, about pedipalps, um, there's, a, there's a paper by uh, Wolf and Schoenhoff and Martins and Weinhoven and Taylor and Gorb, um, which is that, but it's the one you can see on, on screen. And everything you ever wanted to know, really, about uh, harvestman pedipalps, in particular the glandular hairs. Um, and I mentioned that there are various spines and tubercles and, and the structures on these. Um, and so your pedipalp may have some of these uh, glandular hairs and these, these um, clavate or, or capitate uh, structures here. So these are like little lollipops or drumsticks. And, uh, and these, are, these have got glue on the end. And so if, you, if it just sends that out and it touches a springtail, um, they, they, they stick. Now, it may not be a permanent thing, but it, it's certainly enough to get hold of the thing and then start to manipulate it and hold it within its palps to, to grab hold of that um, prey item. And they've also got various sort of, sort of um, plumose, different, all sorts of different structures. And that paper shows such a wide variety of different structures of these spines and hairs and uh, but in particular, these, these sort of uh, glandular ones, which are producing um, these sticky buds. Um, but equally, they may have uh, these apophyses that I mentioned, um, these bulges on the femur there, or particularly on the patella, these uh, drooping, bulging um, uh, uh, apophysis at the end of each of those. And it may, maybe it's got both. Um, so this is a dichronopalcus. Uh, ramosus and this has got a very long um, hypothesis from the patella there and it's also got lots of these little uh, sort of uh, clavate um, um, tubercles of um, spines of one sort or another so various hairs of various structures it's interesting just as an aside really here since we've got this picture of uh, dichronopalpus the male this is a female and it's got these um, sort of sticky uh, uh, sticky buds all over this apophysis. Um, the male is a, it's a much thinner and um, less uh, less hairy structure in the male. This apophysis, and he ha he actually uses that uh, uh, that extension to tuck behind the female's legs when they mate. So during copulation, he just it's a really useful little peg to hold her in place while they're mating. Um, presumably, um, the fact that there aren't sticky glue guns all over that um, is, is presumably because once he's got hold of her, the last thing he wants is to not be able to escape again from her um, because he's glued himself to the front of, of a female dichronopalpus. So the males don't have the sticky buds, but the females do. Um, so whether that gives her an added, uh, advantage in uh, prey capture and hunting, who knows? So perhaps the females are, are more successful as, as um, in their, in their uh, endeavours to catch prey. But uh, just an interesting uh, little aside. Um, I'll mention the palpal claw. If you, this is a species called Piliocanestrinii, and right at the end of the of the palps here so the pedipalp has got a little claw at the end now you might not need to worry about that normally um, they're very tiny and very hard to see so there there is the claw at the end of the pedipalp and if I enlarge that a bit more you can see okay it's distinct and if I enlarge it even more you can see that it's got like a comb underneath in this species now for the benefit of my Field Studies Council guide, I make a note of whether there's a palpal claw at all, or whether it's a toothed palpal claw or a smooth palpal claw. It's, it's a detail which you don't normally need to worry about, but if you are using the later editions of um, Hilliard, Hilliard and Sankey, um, for identification, quite early on, if you're using the key, quite early on, um, 
and as you as you're sent off to the different genera um, you come across this and it's asking whether it's got a smooth palpal claw or not and in reality you don't really need to know and, and i'm pointing this out to you because it's not it's not of huge importance because if you're working through this case, I know as a fact, when I started looking, um, not so much in this first edition, but in, in, in the second and third edition, you tend to get a bit stumped if you can't quite see and you worry about it, you can't move on. The fact remains that if it's got a toothed um, palpal claw like that, um, so look, this is, this is, uh, an example so along the bottom you can see that it's it's marked as to how that is and the species above uh, are actually um, so all of these up here have a, uh, no palpal claw at all but if it's got that toothed palpal claw it'll have really long legs um, so at the, the the last few here that are, are mentioned with a toothed palpal claw are the ones with the tiny little bodies and the really long gangly legs. So um, there's only one exception um, really to that, which is uh, homolinotus, which does have a toothed palpal claw. Um, but you'll know that because it's got four big spines sticking out its back end. Um, so basically, I'm, I'm telling you all about palpal claws, so you know what it is, so you can largely ignore it because I think it is one of those things where when you're first starting out, you, you kind of go, oh, oh, invertebrates and their stupid tiny little um, features. You very rarely need to know that to identify it to species. So don't worry too much about palpal claws. Uh, mentioned the uh, chelicery earlier. These are just these pincer mouth parts. This is Rallina triangularis um, or Platybunus triangularis, its name fluctuates somewhat. I mentioned that on the front of the chelicera, there are these broad points, and that's really distinctive. You sit on the far side. So if in doubt, if you've got an adult male, it's only in the male, if you've got an adult male Rallina triangularis, uh, the front edge of the uh, chelicery will have a lovely uh, point to it. So that's really helpful. Uh, generally speaking, there are one or two other characters, but um, these are just pictures to show the variety of uh, forms that there are, but they're all very fairly similar, black tipped, um, biting, tearing claws. The trident I mentioned is uh, variable. Uh, you may have one where there's a long central member and a couple either side. Uh, you may have one where there's actually nothing in the center, but a couple of accessory spines either side where there might have been a trident. You might have one which is classic, classically got a trident, three prongs. Like this one is uh, three prongs, like a, described in the key as, as, a, as a garden fork. So it's got three equal lengths, uh, prongs to that trident. Uh, likewise, this one's got a, a larger uh, central member with a few accessory claws around the edge. So these accessory claws will be described in, in, in most keys. Um, something like this in Odielus, big, fat, three uh, beautiful trident members, really obvious, an absolute giveaway to the species. Um, does have a few extra little bumps and lumps of accessory spines around it. So that's the trident. It's fairly obvious. It's just um, this structure just in front of the ocularium at the front edge of the cephalothorax. Mention the ocularium that can vary in how many spines and bumps there are. It might be completely smooth with just a few little hairs. It might have really distinctive long spines or three or four, um, four, seven, whatever, um, spines on each side. And in the descriptions in a key, it might say four, uh, but what that means is four on this side and four on that side. Um, so if I refer to it as having seven uh, tubercles on the ocularium, I mean 14. I mean, there's 
Um, I mean, seven on um, one side, seven on another, four on one side, four on another, however it works out. Um, so that might be quite low and flat. It might be quite upright and uh, obvious. The body I mentioned before is this, this classic sort of single fused round globular sort of form. And it may though be quite flattened in some species, quite a different form and, and structure entirely. Um, so this, the form of the body is distinctive. And again, the pattern of the saddle, this is an obvious saddle. Um, it's got a, clearly a dark pattern against a light background, but you still will find that the term saddle is used for perhaps even four pairs of dots or something like that. So the saddle is four pairs of dots. So anything that's a pattern on the back um, counts as a saddle. Legs, again, the length, the relative length of the body, the shape, how angular they are, whether they're smoothly rounded or angular, all of these things um, may be described, but aren't always that critical. Um, but the length, the relative length is again mentioned in, um, in the field guide as just this little M or L or V um, or S at the end, um, meaning that it's relative to the body, they're quite short or it's got a tiny body and very long limbs. So that's a relative term. So just, just if you see that and wonder what on earth that means, it's just a relative term. It's not really a, a science in any way. It's just a sense that it's got kind of medium length legs. It's got really long legs. It's got quite short legs. And the males do have, whoops, a very characteristic uh, penis. And as you can see, those are really wildly different. Um, this, this is sort of an arrow head with, with barbs all down the side. This one's got a, like a sword with a sword guard there. Um, they've got, often got a little uh, stylus at the end, maybe different structures to the, 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 the sort of long um, stem, if you like. Um, the structure at the, the, the head end, the glands may also be quite different. Um, so a slightly specialist, and we'll talk about it more next week, but just to show you, they are pretty characteristic. Um, and so given the, from those sorts of things, so you're looking at the body, the trident, the ocularium, the palps, chelicery, the legs, and for each of those on the um, uh, identikit online form, you, know, you just pick what you can say about each of those and this will tell you that it's the most likely species at the top. Um, what I'm trying to get across and what I will uh, point out as we go through the species is for all of these, the whole point, I think we mentioned it in the question time last week, a dichotomous key, you've only got to know one thing or another. You're comparing one thing or another, but some of those things are difficult to see. Some of those things might not be fully formed because it's not an adult. So. Um, dichotomous keys have their limitations. These are great and very popular as, as a method, but if you're not careful, you try to put like a hundred uh, things down uh, that you can see. Um, when actually this other dorsal markings question at the bottom, all black with two pale patches, that's the key one. Uh, that would give you the species. Um, which will be nemostoma by maculatum in this case. Um, but you might sweat over how many, has it got rows of tubercles? Um, what shapes the saddle? I don't think he's got a saddle. Um, so um, I don't want to put you off this in any way. This works really well. And I know a lot of people use it very successfully. What I'm saying is uh, don't get caught up in trying to answer every question and then doing the same for the trident and the same for the palps and answering everything. Um, get, get something that looks at the top of your list like it looks significant. This one's clearly four as opposed to all of those much lower numbers. Click on the camera icon and that will show you some pictures and then you'll start thinking, oh no, it's not that, or yes, that's the beast. And then you can perhaps start to um, refine what, you, what you're looking at. So let's look at some species. So there is the aforementioned nemostoma by maculatum. So this in theory is a really easy British species to identify. 
Um, unfortunately, it's not necessarily, um, well, I, I'm just going to complicate your lives very slightly by saying there might be some others, cryptic species hiding within these populations, which we, I'd like you to look out for. But generally speaking, if you've got a small black harvestman that you found under a log or under a stone, and it's got two little silvery white spots, it will be Nemostoma bimaculatum. Sometimes these spots might be slightly divided. This is one I found only a couple of weeks ago, um, which might throw you a little bit. There is also a variety called unicolor, and that has no spots. So you may find that you found a, an all black nemostoma bimaculatum, and it has no bimaculatum. It doesn't have two um, spots, but the, if you collect males, and I would encourage you to collect males of these, um, there may be um, another species hiding, um, which I will talk about next week. There is Nemostoma lugubri, which is possibly and um, might be in Britain, Dentigerum potentially, or Paranemostoma uh, quadripunctatum. They're all a little bit similar, but have not been recorded in Britain before. So um, generally, black, two white spots, it's going to be an emostoma. If you can, if you want to find a new species to Britain, then collect males. Males tend to be relatively easy to identify. Um, if you've got a hand lens, um, I don't think these images show it quite as well as it might. But this picture here, the top of the, uh, the sort of top corner of the chelicera here have these sort of pointed structures, um, and they're, they're very diagnostic to species. And so that's very helpful to at least know that it's a male. Also, if it's a male um, Nemostoma bimaculatum, it has a sort of a bulge at the front of its shin. Um, and say, I can't show you in these pictures, these females won't, but these two males sort of here, there's a bulge. Um, so it has, a, it, it has a swollen shin at the top. Um, so that's that's quite helpful. So you'll be able to see um, if it's got this, this structure is the most obvious and the bulge, it's a male. Also, the females tend to be slightly more bulbous, especially if you, she's gravid like this one. And the males are much more uh, sort of truncate and cut off and the abdomen kind of disappears away at, at the tail end. Um, so do do collect if, if, you're, if you're happy to do so. Um, the males, and you may be able to turn up one of these new species, but we'll look at that next week in detail um, as to what we might be looking for there and not worry about it too much this week. Um, this is the one where the, 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 it's slightly separated that white spot and had me looking for quite a long time as to what this could be because it also had some bumps on the back. But I, I dissected it and the penis is definitely Nemostoma bimaculatum. Uh, this is a juvenile and looks nothing like it. Um, the juveniles we'll look at a little bit in a minute, just show you comparisons. Um, its eyes, I suppose the ocularium is not dissimilar, but it's a much paler thing, quite shiny. It hasn't got this granular surface and, and it's nothing, it's not black at all. It has no white spots. So quite difficult with an immature in these cases. So say so next week, we'll look at some others. Now, this was found during lockdown uh, last year by uh, David Holland um, and it's an absolutely fabulous beastie and it's slightly smaller than Nemostoma bimaculatum and you would be forgiven for thinking that that's what it is because it's a black harvestman tiny little thing with silvery white spots. Um, but if, and this is not the light catching it, this is not the flash, these are white spots at the back. So it has two white spots at the back, silvery white. Uh, its name is Hystricostoma argentiolunulatum. Argentiolunulatum, silver moon spots, presumably. Um, so these crescent moon shapes, uh, silvery spots at the back uh, uh, are how it gets its name. But more distinctively than that, it's got 10 spines on the back. So 
It's a little nemastoma by maculatum to all intents and purposes, but it's got 10 nice spines down the back. It's got two extra crescent or at least straight lines, depending on, on how it is, is slightly varied. Um, these lovely little white spots. It's a very granular surface and it's a much shinier um, and sort of brassy colored. It's a sort of metallic brass color, um, not just plain black, but the palps are also very pale. So unlike nemastoma, it's got these pale, thin palps. And if you're fortunate enough to have a male, as this is, and uh, thank you for David to, for sending me this, um, it's got a spine on the inner side of the patella there of the pedipalp. So quite a distinctive little spine there, which um, is, is not the case in nemastoma. So I don't want to labor, I, I really want to rattle through some of these species to make the point that they're really easy. So there we are. It's only in one place that we know of so far in Kent, but it, it could easily be overlooked because people think it's nemastoma. So it's got extra white spots, it's got 10 spines, and if it's a male, it's got this little um, spine. There are other uh, characteristics too, uh, but also fairly pale, thin palps. Um, but you've got enough to go on there. If you see one of those, we'd love to know about it because um, it's only known from one site so far. Uh, Mitostoma chrysomelas. Um, again, the character you're looking for, the one thing that will tell you it's this, is these, the way it holds these long pedipalps at the front and they are covered in these little sticky lollipops. And they, it, it, here you see they're sort of held up in a sort of triangular form up over the, over the top, sometimes quite away um, over the back of its head. They're very long, and when you see it from above, they seem to be quite, looks like it's got something sticking out at the front. And closer examination shows it's these palps, which may be out the front or held back. Um, and they are very, very, um, very much covered in these, these sticky hairs. Um, Beyond that, there are a whole host of things which will tell you it's mitostoma chrysomelas, but that, that character will really uh, nail it for you. This female, this, th again, these are not flash um, uh, effects. This, these are gold spots. The females are really quite pretty there. They are almost a metallic gold, these spots. Um, and, and so she can look really lovely. Um, these are both males, a little bit darker, a little bit dingier, but both of them have got these quite well hedge rows they've got these ridges right across the body which you can see a very regular um but it's it's it, it's like a like series of walls uh, across the body and they're all over the place and these irregularly shaped bulges um that go right across the body but you can see these glistening um uh, glue balls on the end. The actual spike at the end of this isn't isn't circular. It, it's it's quite a it's quite a spiky structure on the end of the stick, but it exudes a glue, so it looks circular, and you've got this blob of glue at the end. So quite a distinctive creature. Um, and you see there, even in the juvenile, which looks nothing like it again. So it's not the juvenile sh shiny and smooth. Doesn't have those ridges. Um, but it is still holding these um, long palps up in this sort of triangular pattern over its head, or will hold them out at the front. Um, it's, a, it's a very delicate and small creature, but when you see it trotting through um, uh, moss, um, it's, it's quite, a, quite an obvious thing, um, but a, a delightful creature. I mean, this, this underneath, you can see this is a male. You can see the penis um, is almost the entire length of the abdomen. And this is the genital perculum um, from which it uh, exudes. Um, so yeah, mitostoma chrysomelas, long sticky palps. Um, just to compare the two. So these are mitostoma um, juveniles, and these are all immature nemostoma. And you can see that um, nemostoma is a bit flatter, 
Um, it's a bit more angular at the back end, uh, whereas mitostome was a much more uh, globular, circular sort of body. The, um, and the palps are still very distinctive in mitostoma, whereas they're the sort of pale and relatively normal um, in, uh, in, in nemostoma. As it gets a bit older, nemostoma, you can see, eventually starts to show um, some white spots, um, but isn't a, it's still quite smooth and shiny there. And, it, and even on this juvenile, it's got quite pale palps, uh, unlike the, the adults that we saw earlier. So not easy to, to recognize the immatures, but I think you could probably tell the difference between these two uh, at a pinch. Uh, Nemostomella basilifera, which used to be called Syntetostoma basiliferum, um, this is, it's almost certainly just an imported species from probably Spain, um, but it's really obvious, look, it's, it's a hedgehog, it's the hedgehog harvestman, it's got spines all along its back, um, it might sit in a, an unusual posture like that, it's quite a small, delicate, very gangly, you, f it, 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 you feel it's going to break, um, very slender legs on it. Um, but for such a small thing, it's got really long legs, big fat patella, um, patelli, uh, but it's a hedgehog. So it's got a variety of different um, black and white markings, silvery white markings, um, but you don't really need to worry too much about it because if it's got these spines, and, and they're not just in a row down the back as they were in Hystricostoma, they're also in you know, several rows or well, three rows of them at the back end as well. So you, it's, it's a very spiny thing. It only occurs in a couple of places around Plymouth, I think. Uh, I think it's still there. Um, so very scarce in this country. Much more common, I've found it in Spain, um, in the Pyrenees um, and the Basque region. So um, quite distinctive when you see it, but very delicate. Um, you can see, uh, similar to where I was saying, recognising a male of nemostoma, these structures at the top of the chelicery um, are indicating that that's more than likely a male, um, and, and you can see them there. So, um, yeah, if you see one of those, we'd really like to know about it because they're very, very scarce and only in a couple of locations. It's the sort of thing that might get imported in with plants, uh, but nemostoma basilifera hedgehog harvestman. So a couple of flat things now. Uh, Trogulus tricarinatus is uh, very, very flat, covers itself in soil granules and doesn't move very much. So it's very hard to find. It doesn't run around. It doesn't attract your attention if you find it in some leaf litter. Um, and they feed entirely on snails. So um, they, they feed in and they'll get into a snail shell and they lay their eggs inside a, an old snail shell as well. Um, relatively scarce in that it's not easily found. Very much a south coast thing. So this is one of the things which will be on chalk and um, limestone in the south. Um, and there is a possibility that another species of Trogulus, um, Nepiformis, may occur in, in Britain. Um, there's not much in it. They're a bit darker. I mean, possibly like this, um, rather than this sort of pale brown. And the eyes are more spaced apart. Um, the eyes of a of Tricarinatus tend to be perhaps a couple of eyes width in between. So these are these are not too far apart, whereas in um, Nepiformis they are. But we don't have Nepiformis as far as we know. Um, so um, I'm very interested to see um, Trogulus species and, and, and have a closer look at them, but they don't occur around, uh, around my way, so I don't see them very often. This is a juvenile one, very pale, um, just starting to cover itself in bits of uh, soil. This one you can see where the soil's over the body surface and makes them very hard to find in, uh, in soil. Um, you can see the key character of these things is that they have this sort of hood over the mouth parts and, with the, and the mouth parts are tucked away, hidden underneath. Um, so they're still there. These the, the, the pedipalps are here and the, and the chelicery, and you can see them dangling down beneath. 
Um, um, but we'll we'll look at the uh, the next species in a moment. Has a very similar uh, hood. This is a bit more complete, probably, whereas the the next one is sort of like two lots of bristles coming together. Um, but it's not easy to uh, distinguish them in that way. But they are these are Trogulus is a much bigger creature. It's twice the size of Analasmacephalus, which is the next one. Also, its legs are not that bristly. This photograph is quite close up, so they look like it's got quite um, bristly legs. But it's it's a much thinner legged creature, Trogulus. And if you look at uh, leg pair one or two, the last just the tarsi at the end. There are just two segments. So one there and one there. So we'll have a look at this, its small cousin, Analesmacephalus cambridgii. And I'll just move on one, uh, two in fact. You can see this has got three, I mean, it's very subtle, but the, uh, the leg, legs one, this legs one and two, they don't cover the, the, their toes, if you like, um, in soil. So they're they're naked and not covered in soil at the at the tarsi at the tarsal end, um, and there are just one, two, three in this. But in Trogulus is one, two. So subtle, but there you go. But this is half the size. Also covers itself in soil, as you can see. But its legs are a bit bristlier. Um, and so they they seem to be a bit fatter, a bit spinier, adhere to more soil particles perhaps. This one's um, relatively young and hasn't covered itself completely in soil yet. Um, and you do tend to see little gaps where the soil's rubbed off. Um, but also the the mask over the top, this hood. Um, you can see this one isn't really as complete as as in Trogulus, so it's more of a series of spines coming together. Uh, they play dead when you find them, so that makes them even more difficult to uh, re recognise. So this is under a stone. It looks like a piece of soil and it doesn't move. Um, but it's still got these. It, it's, it's not got any boots on. It, it's got bare feet, so as you can see. And um, when you, when you recognise that it's a, it's a harvest moon, you can see its eyes on a slight ocularium. It's got this hood, which is not quite as complete. And uh, yeah, it's, it's top and bottom covered in soil. But yeah, very, very spiny um, limbs. Um, but yes, but smaller all round. <clears throat> Before they cover themselves in soil, if you're fortunate to find a juvenile, these are about two millimeters long, this, I think this, if that, um, it's purple. Um, the juvenile stages is a sort of lovely pinky purple. So this is an absolutely delightful looking thing, but it's really, really small. It looks like a mite and it's, it's the size of a mite. Um, so if you see a little purple mites, do have a closer look. It could be Analasmacephalus cambridgii. Um, but before long, I mean, these very conveniently stood in exactly the same position, which is very nice. Um, so no soil and then covered in soil. And you see it's got bare feet um, and three segments. So that's that's the difference between Trogulus and Analasmacephalus cambridgii. This is another relatively scarce one, Sabakai. This is a delightful, a beautiful little um, gangly, delicate harvestman, really. Again, it's got quite long legs for, for um, such a small species. But I, I hardly need to show you what characterizes this. Look at the palps on this. Um, it's got boxing gloves, spiny boxing gloves. Um, and the whole of the, the sort of the, these, these last three segments of the palps at least are sort of expanded and very spiny um, and absolutely diagnostic, even in, even in a juvenile. Um, the eyes are quite, Glassy. It's almost not got an ocularium as such. It's just got big bulgy eyes, um, lovely dark glassy eyes. And say so it's just it's not really a raised ocularium. It's just two big, uh, prominent eyes as much as anything else. Um, they also have these lines of spines across the body. Um, this is a male. 
and this one's a female. Um, so it's quite a spiny animal all over, uh, really. Um, this male is again very truncate at the back. Um, the female's much more bulbous there, but both very diagnostically got these uh, bulges, um, boxing gloves at the end of the palps. You'll find this in South Wales. I think it's now in the wire forest, just crept into England. Um, but it, it's really just just South Wales and just slightly into England, as far as I'm aware. Um, again, something if you see that. Um, really important thing to record, lovely little creature. Um, and here again, just in case you find immature, so mitostoma with its long um, palps open over its head like that. Um, nemostoma, still shiny, still shiny. They don't look anything like the adults really, but its palps are just sort of relatively thin and white and not doing anything. But this, in, in Sabacon, um, even in an immature, you can see it's still got these big um, boxing gloves. Um, so even here, tiny little, you know, it, this one's still got spines on its back, but big fat palps. So um, Sabacon Biscayanum Ramblianum. So um, um, yeah, named after Biscaya, no doubt, in the Basque region. Um, where I've seen it over there, certainly. So yeah, immatures, you could just about do them if, if, if you do find those things, but certainly Sabacon um, sticks out like a sore thumb. And I think Christian Owen has been putting some great pictures on uh, Facebook recently of these in the egg. And you can see, you can see them formed inside the egg before they hatch. Um, so it's worth looking on the Facebook group, um, Harvestman UK. And, and have a look at Christian Owen's pictures of those uh, in South Wales. Okay, another, these are blindingly obvious if you find them, if you're fortunate enough. They, so far, I think only in Plymouth and Guernsey um, and was found only in 2017. It's orange. And this is, um, this is the land, um, one belonging to the Laniatories um, suborder. So it's the only one in Britain, we had none of these uh, before. Really distinctive, apart from being bright orange, it's got this incredibly raised pointed uh, ocularium, two little um, beady eyes. You can just see the beady eyes at the bottom, either side there, a little orange, everything's orange. Uh, the mouth parts sort of uh, almost transparent amber uh, with long thin spines, which is quite a sort of laniatorian um, feature um, and if you're fortunate enough to get a male and um, this this is a male all of these pictures are male they have this enormous um, ridiculous sort of uh, projection off the um, uh, we're on the trochanter of the hind leg so that there uh, in a male is really again very diagnostic you can see it here um, quite a long structure, whether that's something that is the male grab, uh, the female holds on to when they're mating or perhaps he, her legs wrap over it, who knows, I'm not quite sure what that does. Um, but it's tiny mite-like thing, not a, not a big thing, and uh, so far only in Plymouth and Guernsey. So <clears throat> really distinctive and uh, could be anywhere really, I think, if it's, it's probably been introduced. Uh, this was certainly the Plymouth one, I think was in a cemetery. So uh, turn over a few stones and uh, see what you can find, but it, it is a very distinctive beast. So I'll say no more, Scotolimon dorii, uh, a male. Um, I'm not seeing a female, but um, they're largely the same without that. Odialis, <coughs> excuse me, Odialis spinosus, um, the female, and the male, well, I'll show you in a second. Really distinctive characteristics. Well, this is, this is the most spider-like possibly of our species. It's, uh, it's quite big. The body is, is very bulbous. It's, it's one of the biggest um, bodies. Um, its legs aren't enormously long, and it does tend to pull them up over its body, like in this resting position in a very spider-like way. But um, really distinctive because it's got a, a really dark 
truncation, a truncated cut off end to the um, saddle markings. So quite parallel sided and dark uh, and abruptly cut off at the end. But it's got these tri this trident at the end at the front, um, which I'll uh, we'll see better in another picture. But the beautiful things in close up, not all these rings of of grey and browns and whites, and they're really quite an attractive thing in, in close up, as you'll see. And this male is is quite beautiful, really. But against this this the outline of the saddle is quite um, dark and the end is very black and very abruptly cut off. But the character you're looking for, these orange with sort of pale tips, these, these trident, there's almost like a ski slope that comes down from the um, ocularium that swoops down to the front. Um, and there's a ski jump at the end uh, with these three trident members, which are just more far more um, robust than in any of the other species. So very easy, really. It's got this truncated um, saddle and three very obvious um, trident members. There are a few extra little accessory members around there, um, but, but usually this sort of pale um, ski jump, uh, ski slope sort of effect as well, running down from the ocularium. Very spiny elsewhere as well. <clears throat> ODLs do tend to be very spiny um, genera, but it's the only one we get in this country. The next two, I'm just going to show you the males because the males are really pretty straightforward. The females we will address next week. Mitopus mori are pretty common, um, often sitting on umbellifers and nettles and very big leafed um, uh, vegetation. You, you quite often see these things sitting around. Um, the males of an egg timer, a very black egg timer pattern. So the saddle is pinched in the middle, um, expands onto the cephalothorax, expands out to the back of the abdomen. It can vary. This one in the top right shows that it can be a little bit more mottled and perhaps not as obvious. And this one's, this one's sort of colored a bit like the female. Um, but still quite a, a, a pinched waist, um, doesn't have a trident. There are one or two other characters that um, if you're following the key, um, you'll, you'll, you'll need to find. But actually, in, in reality, if you see a fairly cream, pale coloured harvestman with this hourglass marking, it's going to be Mitopus morio. Um, and quite often have quite a dark, dark palps, but I'm, I'm not going to confuse matters by telling you all the other characteristics of spurs and not spurs on the on the palps and the chelicery for these. For these, it's that hourglass, uh, the egg, uh, I guess, hourglass egg timer is the word I'm looking for, um, egg timer. So broad at the top, a number eight as well. You might think of it as just having a, a sort of figure eight pattern on the back. Um, the other male, which is really obvious, is Phalangiomopilio. Um, on the at the corner of the uh, chelicery are these enormous horns. You can see this with the naked eye while you're standing up. You don't even need to bend down to see this. Um, it's a very orange, um, browny orange beast. Can be quite red, um, but these horns at the front are so obvious, sticking out at the front. It's a very spiky. Um, species. Uh, the female is very spiny, her legs are very spiny and they're right across the body. Um, but these two horns at the front are absolute giveaway. So Phalangiomopilio has these big horns that stick out at the front. You can picture actually they're that far forward that it makes the ocularium almost central. It doesn't even appear to be at the front of the, um, of the body. It's almost dead centre. It's that, it's that they're that far forward, these things. But I, you, you generally, genuinely can recognise these um, almost without bending down to look at them. And they, they trot around. I've, I've watched one guard a stone, just sitting on a stone, and it was it's like one of those toys that won't fall off the edge, and it would just keep guarding and protecting its territory on, on a stone. Quite fascinating beasts. But 
amazing, absolutely amazing thing, but really easy to recognize, a male phalangemopilia. The females of phalangemopilia matopus morio um, are quite similar. So all those pictures, so all of these are phalangemopilia and all of these are matopus morio. And the saddle pattern is very, very similar. The palps look very similar. Everything looks very similar. We'll show you how to recognize the difference between the two next week. Um, <clears throat> another apilio, um, uh, oh, uh, an apilio, we start on the apilios. Apilio canestrinia, I was quite um, new to Britain, found in Essex in 1999, and a few years later, found one in my back garden, and now it's, it's pretty much everywhere. Um, it's the red harvestman. So it's got a, an all red body, reddish orange, um, like this is very typical, very black contrasting legs. This would be a lovely typical example, quite long, simple, straight palps <clears throat> dangling down at the front as well. Opilio canestrinii. This is the male. Um, the key characteristic, which is true of both male and female, is the trochanters, this this basal segment here, so above the coxae, but below the femur. So this little segment here is the same color as the body. So in all of these, you see that the first segment of the leg is the same color as the body. So it's the pale orange color. And even in this juvenile, where it's not got very black legs, it's just sort of a gray leg, the trochanters are still the color of the body. So it's it's almost got this starfish-like uh, appearance against these black legs, uh, and, and that is quite obvious. Um, but also, and I'll point them out here, these little black and white markings, which you don't always see so much on the male, um, but are certainly obvious in the female. And that's the female. So you've got this same, as I say, here's the pale colored trochanters, same as the body. And even in a juvenile, they're still not quite the same colour as, as the leg, um, but these paired black and white stripes um, along the body are real, uh, a real giveaway. So black, white, black, white, black, white, all the way along. But also they're both male and female have got really quite white uh, rings around the eyes. Um, and so that's enough, really, that's enough information. Um, to recognize Apilia canestrinia, and it is now really quite widespread, and so really interesting to record, and it has taken over from some of the other Apilio species, so really important to record these things to see how this species has possibly replaced the one that was here before. The one characteristic I'll point out before we move on to the other Apilios is there are no marks on the coxae, so look underneath here, you'll see there are no patches of dark coloration under these coxal um, segments, unlike these. So the other two Apilio species have dark patches on the coxa. So uh, this picture in the bottom left, you can see these dark smudges are quite clear. And Canestrinii doesn't have that, but Paratinus and Saxatilis do. So this is Paratinus. It's a real classic sitting on the wall kind of species. Uh, Peritinus is quite big, um, a robust looking thing. I find it quite hard to describe it actually. Um, it's sort of variable. It's sort of not got much in the way of obvious pattern. It sort of can be all sorts of grays, browns and, and, and dark patterning as this one is. This is, a, this is a beauty, but they're very spiky, very spiny and they have quite a lot of spines on the ocularium. So they might have perhaps seven on each side. Uh, this one has perhaps got slightly fewer, um, but they can have perhaps four to seven. And the male, again, you see not, not a lot to go on, um, not a lot of, of patterning, but it's got the dark patches underneath uh, on the coxie, and it's got quite a lot of spines on the ocularium. So it's got lots there and it's, it's a very spiny beast and it's quite big and it's got long legs and more likely to be reasonably high up, um, probably sitting on a wall. Apilio, there you are, just, yeah, just a couple of pictures of it, just typically sitting on a brick wall. Uh, Apilio saxatilis, on the other hand, still shares the spots, 
underneath the coxae, but not so many spines on the ocularium, just a couple on this one on each side, um, barely anything seen on that one there. Um, you can see perhaps three on each side, but fewer. It's smaller, tends to be more in leaf litter, down on the ground, but you, you may find them um, sunning themselves on a wall. You may find them uh, associated with paratinus as well. Um, again, the patterning is fairly uh, nondescript, but they do, I never quite know how to describe this, but if you've ever seen anyone making a Bakewell tart or a cake where you put um, icing down in one line and then draw um, a, a needle through it to make a pattern, that's what, that's what the pattern is on the back of Apilio sexatilis. Someone has drawn a needle through that, those nice straight lines and sort of brought them forward. I don't know quite whether chevron is the word I'm looking for, but it's scalloped somewhat. So it's, so it's sort of brought forward um, and then that's the best way I can describe it. Not always that obvious, um, but, but, but mostly that it, it's quite clear. Um, sand dunes, you'll find these things again, they're much, much lower down and it's slightly smaller. It's legs are a little bit um, uh, less long in comparison to peritinus. And the, um, it's, it's first and its third pair of legs are a bit fatter and um, the, the second pair of legs are quite thin. Um, so you can see on this one and here, so you've got this quite a fat leg, quite a, a thick leg there, and the second pair is, is, is quite thin. Um, it's not an absolute giveaway kind of character, but really you're looking for paratinus or saxatilis have got these spots underneath the coxae, so you know it's one or the other. If it's got these lovely sort of scalloped patterns, it's saxatilis. And I'll just show you the female. So she's got that. This just shows it quite clearly here. It's sort of, it's drawn up the center, this pale line um, that, that brings the pattern with it um, as it, as it uh, into that strange um, double scallop. Um, but also, if I go back one, there is a difference in the shape of the genital operculum. So if you're really sweating over it, and you're not quite sure. Um, there's a there's a bit of a dint in the top of Saxatilis um, genital operculum there. So it's not smoothly rounded. It's got a bit of a dent. It's yeah, hopefully you won't need to look at that, but it, it, it's a helpful character. But again, from underneath, you can see these black patches on the coxae are, are quite distinctive. So you're only trying to separate two species and more often than not, the pattern on the back will give it away. If not, it, the, the number of spines on the ocularium. And so um, that, that, the, the, the fatness of the legs isn't that helpful, but there we go. Anyway, Megabonus diadema. I'd love to just breeze past this one. I know it's everyone's favourite. Um, the crowned harvestman, Megabonus diadema. It's got a crown on its head. That's all you need to know. Yeah, they have incredible, um, these apophyses on the patella and uh, I'm not sure which bit, but the spines on the uh, femur there. Um, but these, um, they're covered in these glandular sort of um, CT again. And you can see here, very spiny, and even the spines uh, extend to the coxae uh, at, at the front of the body uh, on the first pair of legs as well. So it's very spiny. Um, its leg joints are all very spiny, and it's a, got a crown on its head. Um, it's quite small, usually female, very rarely is it a, a male. Um, let's go back. Um, but um, it's well camouflaged and, and very hard to see in, in among lichens and, and mosses. So Megabunus diadema. Um, Platybunus pinatorum, um, another new species. I found it new uh, to Britain in my garden in 2010, um, but I think Mike Davidson found some specimens in uh, museum collections in Scotland that dated back to 2008. And it, it if you key it out in the older books, um, this is not in them, and, and you will key it out to Rhylena triangularis. 
um, because of this large protruding ocularium and the sort of saddle pattern on the back. But there are a number of distinct differences. This is the time of year to look for this, right? This week, this is the, this is the beast to be looking for. Um, and a number of people have started to find it. I've not seen it in my garden yet. It's very well camouflaged um, when it's down, lower down in, in leaf litter um, and in among uh, and sort of the, the herbs in your garden or wherever. But um, it often sits on a wall. It sits on a whitewashed wall in my garden and um, it's, it's blindingly obvious. Um, but you know, you sit on a, on a brick wall and it's perhaps slightly less noticeable. Key characters, really easy. It's got these enormous white dagger-like spines on its palps. So there's the femur of the palp. Um, you can see them really clearly and um, it's very distinctive. And, and the saddle is sort of dark edged, but it's white edged at the, just behind the ocularium here. So it's got these flecks of white. It's a very dark creature. It's not orangey um, particular. It's about as orangey as you'll ever see it. So it's quite dark, mottled, it's got this um, saddle quite clearly, but it's white markings. It's got a very broad um, sort of uh, amber coloured, russet coloured ocularium, really quite a large ocularium, which is much broader at the rear end than the front. It almost looks like it's forward facing. But these white spines are, are job done. That, that's the beast. So. There's only ever been females found in Britain. Um, if anyone should be um, fortunate enough to find a male, the parthenogenetic in this country so far, but um, they're not always parthenogenetic. So males are produced sometimes. And when they are, um, this is a German um, image um, from Alois Stout that um, he let me use. Um, thank you. Um, and these white spines are clearly black in this case. The palps are very black. Everything about it is black. It's a very dark um, animal. So no one's found a male of this species in Britain yet. So you could be the first. So go and, go and find me one. Um, you see the, um, it's quite undercut the back of the ocularium. Um, so it's re it really looks like it, it's, it's perched on the top, very broad at the back. And this, this very typical brown colour it has in, uh, very large uh, apophyses uh, on the uh, palps. But these daggers, uh, these spines are so distinctive um, on, on these. This is quite, this is a youngish one. Um, but when, when they're adult, um, quite a dark animal with white spines. Uh, and it looks like this sitting on a wall. So these are both from my garden wall. Um, very, very largely unmistakable creature, but you could mistake it for something else, which I'll show you in a second. So that's that's it um, size wise. The legs aren't particularly long in proportion to the body. Um, and this is Leobunum species A, which is you know, got gangly, long, much longer limbs, um, but still quite a large body. But anyway, if you've not seen that, you won't know what this looks like. Um, so this is one that I prodded earlier last year. You can see the spines, um, even with the naked eye. They don't run away much. It's a lovely little creature. Um, it's not that bothered. Um, I've got a lot of footage of me prodding this thing. It just barely goes anywhere and just sits happily on my brick wall um, side of the house. Um, but the spines, when you, you can just walk up to it and you'll, you'll see the white spines on the palps. So this is what it would key out as Mylena triangularis, easier to recognise a male, it has that spur on the front of the chelicery, it's got hypotheses here, it's got tubercles with uh, sort of spine tipped, but they're nothing like the large white straight uh, daggers that you see in Pinotaurum. Um, it's got a prominent, slightly undercut uh, ocularium as, as the other species, Pinotaurum, um, but it, it's more parallel sided. It isn't as broad at the back. Um, and it, it tends to be this more of a pale orange colour. The female 
is a little bit more indis indescript really it's nondescript sorry um sort of a saddle pattern um very mottled quite often have these sort of dark patterning around the front even the males you can see these sort of dark uh dents and trenches all around the cephalothorax um quite deep um uh, apophyses and she'll have these spines um but it's not kinatorum. Um, so again, you're only comparing two species here because of the shape of the ocularium and these apophyses and these spines, but pinatorium, pinatorum, much more distinctive. But at this time of year, this is one of the only species you'll find adult. So you're very likely to see this right now or pinatorum, but this is the common one. So you, Hopefully Rhylena triangularis will be the thing that you will start recording when you stop doing this seminar and you go out tomorrow and start looking um, sweeping um, low vegetation. And just if there wasn't enough, there's the comparison between Pinotaurum and Triangularis oculariums. So it's, it's a much broader ocularium in Pinotaurum. It's a much darker animal and it has white flecks along the back, whereas this is much more uh, orange. When they're young, they and um, they have they, they still have an enormous ocularium. They kind of grow into it, uh, and they still have these enormous apophyses. So this is just a young uh, triangularis, um, but still quite undercut. Um, but yeah, that's the distinction between Pinotaurum and triangularis. Hopefully, you'll find maybe both this spring. Um, Quickly moving through, I recognise time's um, escaped me again. Um, Lophopilio palpinalis. Um, as, you, if, as you're keying things out, the, again, slightly nondescript colour-wise, it's sort of yeah, quite a yellow thing with brown spots and yellow spots. Um, it's got a lot of spines on the, uh, quite long spines on the ocularum, longer at the front. Um, so they tend to be a longer spines at the front than at the back, would be quite distinctive. But big spines, um, same colour as the body, though not white. Um, so tubercles with spines on the tip, um, a very distinctive, um, strong trident, which Pinotaurum and, and, and uh, Triangularis don't, didn't have. You can't see at all that there's a triangle from this angle, uh, a, a trident from this angle, but there is quite a clear one. So this combination, as you're as you're looking at the keys. Um, of these spines at the front and the trident and uh, apophyses on the palps and these spines will tell you that that's Lophopilio palpinalis. Um, the female tends to be perhaps a bit more bulbous, but you can still see she's got a very obvious trident, very distinct spines at the top. Megabunus with its crown on its head doesn't have a trident at the front um, um, and, and a much browner spines on here, but a very, very spiky thing. But you can see this, this image shows it quite well. So that's Lophopilio palpinalis. Uh, where do I find those? Probably low down in, in leaf litter and low vegetation, churchyards, that kind of place, um, woodland. And I don't see it very often, but there is a faint saddle on the back as well. This is, I barely need to pause on this. This is so obvious. Homo linotus quadridentatus has one big central spine at the front like a rocket. And at the back end, it's got four uh, spines. Um, quadridentatus, it's got four teeth. Quadridentatus, four teeth at the back. Um, four teeth at the back of that. And also um, the, the sort of, uh, there, there is a row of, two rows of spines uh, along the back. And, and even to the, at the edge, to an extent, there are, there are sort of bulges and spines. And it's quite spotty, so each of these dark spots has got uh, a, a, a tubercle or a, a, a denticle or a tooth, however you want to describe it. Um, but really obvious, it's a really spiny animal. Uh, its legs are really spiky, but long straight spine at the front, so a trident of one and four teeth at the back, um, unless it's this one, which has got three teeth at the back, but you can see that these two are fused together. So this is one I found, this was in Cranfield um, and uh, in Bedfordshire. So it's actually got three 
Tartarus. So this is Trident Tartarus, really. But but they've just merged together. But you can see one great big trident member at the front, um, raised spines along the back, spotty, very granular surface. A lovely thing, really, really nice. It's, it's not terribly big, um, under stones, under logs, uh, that kind of thing. Um, but really distinctive, so I need to say no more. Um, and then just coming into land with some Laobunum, Laobunum rotundum. Uh, these are the classic little orange body, long black legs. Little orange body, long black legs. Uh, dark eyes, uh, dark ring around each eye. And the female, dark, dark ring around the eyes, slightly bigger body, but still very long legs. And her saddle is like a virtually parallel sided dark saddle tend to expand a little here. So you've got, it's parallel sided, but a little bit of a bulge at the back there. That's really quite consistent. So this one's just a little bit of a bulge at the back, but generally sort of parallel sided dark and black rings around the eyes with a pale line in the center, black rings around the eyes, pale in the center. Um, so that's Leobunum rotundum, female. Leobunum black walleye, Pale around the eyes, dark in the centre. Pale around the eyes, dark in the centre. And instead of a nice parallel sided saddle, it's much more of a triangle. It's much more expanded at the rear. So it's like that in Rotundum, like that in Black Walleye. And they're very easy to identify. So males and females. Um, female certainly very easy because of the difference between that saddle marking, but the eye um, will tell you that it's, despite this not having all that that the female's got and that different saddle marking, still really clearly white round the eye with dark in the center. Again, small, tiny little orangey body, long black legs. So the key element there is Laobun and black walleye, pale around the eyes, dark in the centre, rotundum, dark around the eyes, pale in the centre. And how do I remember that? Well, not everybody may find this useful, but I always say black walleye has not got a black walled eye. That's how I remember it. So the black walled eye is in rotundum. So not a black walled eye in black wall eye. So it's just the opposite to what you might expect. So that may or may not help any of you, but it helps me. So quite clear, uh, pale round the eye with a dark center. And in rotundum, it's dark round the eye, pale in the center. And that is, that will tell you, that will give you that, uh, those two species quite easily. Um, the, this is um, Leobunum gracili, um, used to be called tis Tiskii um, in, in this guide, it's called Tiskii, I think. Um, the so-called blue bobber, um, it's bluish. This is a male, there's a lot of white on the front of these, uh, these this species, um, quite dark pedipalps and dark ocularium. And the, it's quite a blue metallic granular uh, pattern on the back, that's the male. The female, a lot more white, but still quite blue um, uh, patterning on the back, metallic. If this was next to um, the next species, Leobunum species A, you may struggle a little bit. There's a lot more white on the on, on Gracilli um, and one or two other characteristics, which I shan't worry you about. But this is in northern Scotland and Leobunum species A hasn't arrived up there yet. So this is really only in, in, in Scotland. Um, it, there was a record from Derbyshire, which is um, many years ago. So it may crop up, um, but a very long limbed thing. Um, I'm not sure how consistent it is that they have the white knees, but I, the ones that I've seen did have that. Um, but Leobunum species A is another really big um, Leobunum, rather like the last one, but this has this is this was found around Sheffield and Worksop originally. Um, very long limbed thing, 
this was Odellus. So you can see the contrast. This was what we used to think was our biggest, chunkiest uh, harvestman. Um, Laburnum species A uh, trumps that somewhat. It, it's a very big bodied thing with enormously long legs. Um, that's how big it is on my fingers. That's the first one I saw. Um, so it's got a good, you know, an old money five inch leg span, uh, almost six inch leg span, um, 12, 15 centimeters. Um, and we, this one tends to be called the green bobber because this is green metallic. Um, but I don't think that does it justice because I think the female is almost the gold bobber. So sometimes the females are so lovely and golden and metallic. Um, and have this additional sort of the, this sheen of gold around the front and, and often around the side, but is tall and tense and purposely she's quite green, uh, metallic green um, on the on the saddle, not as much white as as uh, Gracilli. Um, the white is 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 in fact golden in this specimen. There's a little bit of variation, so um, yeah, so not always exactly the, the way you're looking at this one, but. Uh, originally, as I say, it was found in workshop by Trevor and Dillis Pendleton. I found it in Barnsley. Then it's been found all over the place. It's in several places around Sheffield now, and it's very distinctive. It, um, the male is beautiful metallic gold, uh, metallic green, um, and it's almost unmistakable when you've got a male. Uh, very dark eyes on the thing, but it's, it's this beautiful uh, deep green. Uh, metallic granular um, colour. When they're a bit younger, there's a bit more pale on the front, um, like this one. You see a little bit more pale white, um, but generally it's a very green thing. Um, characteristically, also there's some very young ones indeed. Very hard to tell Leobunum immatures from one another. These are definitely species A, um, but you know you can't you can't really it could could be that that would be a, um, any number of different Libunums. Um, but they characteristically hang out in gangs, so they're, they're in a big aggregations like that. And you saw the image last week where I disturbed um, this image on the right and they all trotted off. So if you've got something that's a large aggregation, very long limbed, green body, um, it's Libunum species A and it is getting around a bit, so do keep an eye out for it. And then the, the latest Leobunum species, Limbartum, same size as species A, really big, really long legs, um, little body, but not desperately small. That's um, Scotty Lehman, one of the smallest uh, harvestman species, and this is Limbartum. Um, these long, th these palps at the front, this was walking along, tapping like that it was it was finding its way its way along i didn't say that palps were often used as a sensory um, um appendage but but in the case of limbartum they're almost certainly using them at, at some level of uh, for sensory reasons because i've watched them it's like a like an extra pair of legs so the male is bright orange dark black sides and then lovely pale underside um, very distinctive thing and very large. Um, Trevor Stone, thank you, sent me uh, these from Lancashire in 2019. And it's, as far as we know, it's only been found in a couple of places in Lancashire, but um, you may know otherwise. I'll point out this dark line. You'll see it next on the next slide more easily. But both the males and the females seem to have this dark line, um, which sort of bifurcates um, over the uh, supralitralisceral um, lamellae, as that's called. Um, but basically, this fold of skin here has got a couple of dark lines and this dark peg there. But the females, this sort of rose gold, pinky tones um, with black and white spots, and nothing like any other British um, harvestman, really. She's, she's really large. And, 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 and quite a beautiful pale pinky orange, uh, delightful thing. Not got any um, spots underneath uh, the coxia or anything, not much over the ocularium, no spines or anything, and quite a dark eye, but just quite distinct, male, orange, female, pinkish. 
Um, that these are juveniles that hatched from some eggs that um, these these last two bred for me. Um, but again, you wouldn't know. You you wouldn't be able to tell at this stage what species that was really. Um, not really distinctive enough. So lots of resources out there to help you. We'll move on to more slightly more difficult things next week, but not, not really more difficult, just different. Um, use the identity uh, identikit online. Obviously, the more the most recent third edition of Harvestman by Paul Hilliard is the uh, the has all the full information. Go to the Facebook group, British Arachnological Society, um, with all your information and. Uh, yeah, we've already seen that. Look at my Flickr page for more images if you want. Um, those are the international. Um, this this is uh, the Dutch guide, which has got some fantastic illustrations in it and has now been translated into English. So do use that. And do remember to record anything that you find on iRecord and they will go into the system, the national records. So next week we will separate out, separate out a few more of the species but um nothing too complicated so we'll move on from that and we'll finish with the little trotting thing so apologies for overshooting yet again but um hopefully you've learned a few things and i'll i shall stop there okay um, absolutely fantastic again paul um thank you thank you so much i i well you know, with this presentation in particular, I, I really love learning how to identify things from their distinctive features that you can just go, you know, straight to that, that species from, uh, you know, sort of easy, easy wins sort of in a way, even if you're not really studying this, that particular group, you know, you can take a photo and, and identify them from from certain features if you if you get the, if you get the right photos and yeah, I, I just I love how you sort of dis describe things, you know, you think about Bakewell tart design that I get that straight away. I mean, okay. <laughs> I understand that and, <laughs> and how how you, you remember things as well. Just just sharing that actually certainly helps me. Um, so, yeah, and, and I, I didn't actually know about that um, Lancashire species that hasn't been found anywhere else. So perhaps I'll, I'll ask a question about that. Um, in a bit but um yeah no i i yeah i really enjoyed that uh, it's a yeah brilliant sort of guide to the to, well, well we'll see next week about those bit slightly harder things perhaps and um, harder they're just not, yeah they're just different yeah but um look at looking forward to that already so we'll we'll get into some questions um Okay, so the first question uh, was from Stephen William. It was just asking whether that um, identification character table was available for download. Uh, the one I showed that I usually hand out isn't, um, but I alluded last week to this potential that I may be writing an aid gap key, in which case, um, the equivalent will be in that and published eventually. Um, it, it's it, it's not the easiest thing to print out because you need it's on A3, so it's not the sort of thing I I, I send out to people and I, I tweak it and change it a lot. It's the basis for the what what will be on the back of the new guide. So before long, hopefully by the end of the summer, well we're certainly before the end of the summer, there'll be a new version of this um which will summarize the key characters uh and we'll probably have to make it even simpler than that because how we're supposed to squeeze in another six or seven species on into this i'm not quite sure so that's the challenge that i've got ahead of me so no it's not available just yet um in that form wait wait for the guide okay. it won't cost much so resources to look forward to yeah so, great um Okay, a question from Emma Williams. Um, for purposes of recording evidence and verification, are there any recommended techniques for photographing the key features, including ways of, re of retaining the specimen as still as possible, especially for those of us that lack decent photography skills? 
Um, I mentioned last week that I do put my specimens in the fridge before I photograph them. Um, so cool them down. Um, and um, one thing I find is if you're trying to photograph a, a harvest, but put it on something uh, that it, it will run around rather than fall off. So at least you can contain it in an area. I mean, putting a harvestman in a dish is not really helpful. You know, if you're trying to photograph it, they'll just walk out. The small ones won't. So yeah, but can put them on something, um, suspend them on something that, or even put them on a plant where they're happy and then you can photograph them from all angles. But yeah, cool them down. That stops them running around much. They don't, in the daylight, they don't tend to move about much at night. Um, they, in the dark, they seem to be more active. So actually daylight slows them down. And uh, again, I think we mentioned last week, photograph a profile from the side is always good. Face on, uh, showing the pedipalps is always good. And the you know, one sort of above to show the shape of the, the saddle. So if you've got saddle profile and face on, you're pretty much there knowing what you know hopefully from this week and next week there are a few species where it will help if you turn it upside down and photograph the underside as well so if you've got a vague idea of what you're looking for you'll know more what you're photographing but certainly with any invertebrate on the back down the face side view three pictures would be ideal and then one underneath we Harvestman, I, normally I, I don't like trying to identify things from photographs, but harvestman, you really can do 90% of them from a photograph if it's, if it's reasonable. So just, just get it sharp, even if it's far away. I'd rather have a sharp picture that's slightly far, far away than a blurred thing that is big, because you can't see a thing in a, in a, when, it's, when you get too close with your phone camera or whatever. But yes, slow them down with the, with the fridge. Hope that very, very, good, very good tips there, Paul. And yeah, I forgot to mention as well, just another another set of amazing images. You seem to have very almost comprehensive images. You know, they're virtually all yours, aren't they? And you and uh, yeah, they're all, such all, high all, quality. But, all but two, I think, were mine. Yeah, just yeah, just amazing coverage, really. <laughs> Well, I mean, that's why I got into Harvestman. I mean, they are a delight to photograph. And I, I photograph, I tried to, I mean, I was a bit of a train spotter and I tried to photograph every British species. And because I photographed every British species, Field Studies Council said, well, can we gather them together? Um, so, you know, it's not, it's not out of any great expertise in Harvestman, <laughs> frankly. It's because I had a good set of pictures. Well, also you have the expertise, which <laughs> I've learned a bit in the meantime. <laughs> um, okay, uh, on to a question from Morris. Um, we live in the Highlands, Aviemore area, and the Cangorms. Wow, that's absolutely lovely. Uh, what species should we look out for? Ah, yes. If you you say was that um, Cangorms, yeah? Yeah, Aviemore. So, yeah. Um, Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, the interesting thing up there, the, the unique thing, which I I'm, I'm, wasn't even planning on mentioning even next week, is my topus morio, uh, which was that male with the figure of eight or the um, egg timer pattern on the back. Um, there's there's a what was considered to be a subspecies of, or a variety, which is very much in that part of the world. Um, which lives high up um, in um, sort of heather and moorland areas. And it, it had the, it was called Var variety Ericaeus because it lived in Erica, it lived in heather. Um, and it's really only in sort of County Durham and parts of sort of central Scotland that it's been recorded. And it's, it's a much paler, underside and it's got a pale line down the back so I can't describe it to you um, off the top of my head it won't mean anything to you but look out for that that would be interesting because it's considered now that it's not a um, not a subspecies or anything but it's always nice to know where 
the ones that look like that are. It's, it's darker and it's got a pale line down the back. So it looks like Mitopus moria. Otherwise, um, you may find Leobunum gracilli, um, that was called Tiskii. I'm not the first found in Aberdeen. It's been found in Sutherland. I'm not sure if it's been found much further south than Aberdeen. I, I'm, I've lost uh, touch with where that where that's been seen. But certainly, yeah, if you're in if you're in Aviemore and Cairngorms, you've got a couple of species there. That the rest of us, well, a couple of uh, things that the rest of us won't see. Um, otherwise, a lot of the common Lambunums and uh, species that I mentioned today, you'll get a lot of them uh, up there. Okay, they, there you go, Morris. There's a, a couple for you to, yeah. to, to chase there. Um, if I can see a map anyway. Yeah. Would anyone like to, to ask a question uh, to, to speak out loud if you, if you wanted to unmute yourself? Yeah, Alexis. Um, I was wondering with Leobunum species A, is there any kind of like a an ongoing like a concerted death? Where's it come from? <laughs> like, yes, so, like, <laughs> yes I, I did breathe, brush past yeah. it a little bit because I knew time was uh, of the essence. Um, it's still called species A because they've not put a name to it. it it's, been, it's been around for a while now. It, it, it was found in Germany and Austria and it's in, it's in Holland and it's been spreading around before it appeared here. Um, but no one knew where, what, where it was from. Um, and it was quite clearly different to anything and, and, and some very reputable people who record a lot of those countries knew that it, 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 you wouldn't overlook large aggregations of a large metallic green and i mean it's it's that it sits and across your hands it's huge um so they are it's it's been narrowed down as to where it isn't and what it's not um and it looks similar to some species in southern spain but but the leobunums in spain are quite complicated and there's a, there's a couple of papers recently sorting out the taxonomy. Um, so it looks like it could well be Spanish. Um, my own theory in terms of that, I would agree that it could well be Spanish and I was always thinking it might be because when it was first found in Barnsley, it was found in a, a heavy plant hire company um, co compound. They're very proud of it. They're very proud of their big spider, as they call it. Um, it made it made the Barnsley Echo or whatever the paper was, and um, I would go around and these huge earth movers, these big caterpillar things, these with enormous wheels that you could almost step inside. And inside these deep hubs and these wheels, Leobunum species A would be sitting inside the hubs of these enormous wheels, and these they would hire these things out, and they would go to all, all parts of the country. Um, so these big earth movers would be sent off and they'd come back and these big spiders, as they called them, was, were still there, were still underneath. But, you know, they must have escaped from time to time and that would have spread them around Britain. Um, but in talking to the guys there, um, and they said, well, yeah, some of our, we get a lot of our machinery from Spain. So, you know, potentially this heavy machinery has come from Spain and in the same way had all of these Leobunums in, in the hubs uh, of the wheels and, and potentially spread them to Barnsley. And uh, the, good, the good harvestmen of Barnsley have um, spread themselves around the rest of the country. Um, that may not be how they got there. They may be, I mean, they were first found um, on uh, Worksop Priory. So maybe there's a Maybe the clergy are moving them around. I don't know, um, but I'm going with the earth movers at the moment. Um, but but the, the name is getting closer. I, I'm, I'm not promised a name by the end of the year, but I have asked a number of occasions the, the guys that are working on it. I am in, I'm in touch, and it, 
still doesn't have a name. Um, but we're, we all rather like species A now. We're all kind of used to it. Perhaps they'll call it something related. They'll, they'll probably be the Latin for the, the harvestman with no name. Which is it, does, do, the, do the other countries on the continent where it's been found, do they call it the same? Do they call it species A? Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it, I mean, I only call it species A because of the papers that they've produced um, and sort of Carlos Prieto and Hay Beinhoven um, produced papers um, some years ago. Um, and yeah, we, we knew, I knew to be looking out for it before it was found and then um, Trevor mentioned it. You have to be called Trevor to find new species. I didn't know <laughs> that. But two, two of the new species to Britain were by people called Trevor. Um, is it Trevor and Dillis found the one in works of? <clears throat> but uh, yeah, so I, that's that's his name for now. I would be it'd be quite sad when it changes. So even even though that name might have stuck have stuck around for a while, <clears throat> it, it's, it won't appear as a synonym, will it? When when a new name comes along, because it's not officially. <laughs> Oh. But it maybe ought to be. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm I'm looking forward to Labuna species B appearing. Well, that'd be exciting. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know how how the synonyms will work and the taxonomy. I'll let them work out the nomenclature. That's uh, that's another story. That's too complicated for my brain. I'm glad I'm not going to name it. I mean, describe the thing. The Spanish ones are complicated. So uh, there's all sorts out there. So. We shall see. Okay, th thanks for the question, Alexis. And uh, uh, thank you, Paul. Um, okay, well, 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 while we're on Leah Boonham, Leah Boonham then, uh, so this, this, this Lancashire harvestman, uh, how, what's, what's its sort of ecology? How do you find that one? Uh, it's in two gardens, that's oh. how you find it. Um, um, I mentioned, um, I never know how to pronounce Colne in, in Lancashire, C-O-L-N-E, but it was in Colne and a nearby village and uh, Trevor Stone who found it, found it in his daughter's garden and then he found it in his garden and he'd been doing some planting in both gardens um, from material from a local garden centre. So those of you who live nearby, go and check out the garden centres of Lancashire. And uh, it was, I mean, it's a big old thing. It's, it's hard to miss, I think. Um, so, I mean, he, I asked him to go and get one and he just went and had a look and found one on his wall. Um, <laughs> I think it was, I think it was a bit more, I, I think I don't did quite justice to how much he looked for me, but he did find them eventually. And it, it is, it's a sort of wall sitting kind of creature. I'm not quite sure how it lives on the continent. It's quite alpine, so it doesn't mind the cold. Um, so it's quite late in the year, it's quite happy. I think it, I think it hides in crevices in the Alps um, and caves right through to December. Um, okay. So it, it's, yeah, big thing from, from, from the Alps and Lancashire. So you most likely to just find it on walls yeah, I think so. Yeah, more likely just find it tucked away in corners and on walls. Um, I don't really know enough about it, really, to be honest. But it, it's it's one I've always wanted to see. So, you know, it's, when you if you're looking at European harvestmen, you'd think, oh, that that's a smart one. Um, so there's another one I've got my eye on, which I I wait till it appears. But there's a lovely one, just bright pink. Um, but that's not yet appeared. So, so did you just recognise it immediately when you, when Trevor sent you? Yeah, pictures? yeah, pretty much. I mean, it wasn't wasn't right. difficult. Um, yeah, he, he put it on iNaturalist, and someone, um, I think someone in France, nudged me about it and said, you know, you might want to tell Paul Richards, um, and I picked that up and had a look at iNaturalist, and there were the photographs of it. I thought, yeah, that's Lev Bartom. Um, so, I mean, it is so distinctive. It's it's a it's a fantastic thing. And and he sent me three, two males and a female, and they all survived. And even though they're quite big, and they arrived in the post and were happy together. And 
laid some eggs and they hatched out, but um, sadly didn't get very far. Very hard to feed small um, Leobunums. But they um, got through a few stadia, but didn't make it to adulthood, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Well, we'll. I don't know. Maybe maybe we should be promoting people to look to look for that one. I'm yeah, go and have a look. I think it's late late summer thing, so you know, not yet. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I'd like to know if you find more. Okay. Um, right onto a question from Brian. Then, um, what are the typical sex ratios for harvestmen? And the second part of that is. A, uh, oh, well, it's just a, a completely different question, actually. So if you want to go for the first one, what are the typical sex ratios for harvestmen? Um, yeah. British harvestmen, let's only limit to that. Well, I mean, as, as I've said before, if you really want the answer to that, buy this. That is an excellent book, and it will tell you the answer, because I can't. Um, <laughs> not in general speak. In, in, in British, in terms of British species, um, oh, it's very varied. Um, Mega bonus, the crowned one is almost always female, but there are males. Um, Platybonus pinatorum is always female so far, and we've not found a male. Um, I think they tend to see more. No, that's not true. I was thinking Dicranopalpus. I'm not sure. That's probably fairly even. I was going to say there's slightly more females, but I don't know that that's true at all. I see more females because it's frustrating because I'm looking for males so that I can separate them from um, one of the new species. Um, I would say with Nemostoma, the little black and white spotted one, they seem at 50-50, they seem quite even. There's, um, I'm not giving you a definitive, this is just from my experience and my observation. They are quite, um, quite well balanced. But in those where they exhibit parthenogenesis, and there, there is a lot, obviously, there are, there are a few where there are only females. I'm um, just trying to think what else is only female, um, what tends to be female. Uh, so with, the, um, with these aggregations, these large aggregations, these Leobunums, they're very much 50-50. Um, you you, it's not much in it, so the, re the ratio is very very similar between the two so i have no definitive answer but they, it really is quite varied but there are some which are entirely parthenogenetic currently and some which are mostly parthenogenetic but the majority seem to be um probably 50 50. i did make i, I do wonder with something like that diacrana palps i mentioned that the females palps are better at, you know probably better for capturing prey than the male palps and the male palps are better for are probably, you know, they're not so sticky, probably so that he can hang on to a female. So he's presumably at a, a sexual disadvantage to the female because of that, in which case she may, it might, maybe there's a 60 40 um, success, you know, just, just survival rate in, in Dicranopalpus. Who knows? I'm making that up. Somebody go and research that. There you go. Project for you. For the summer. Okay, thank you, Paul. And then, the, then there was another question from Brian. There, um, apart from helping humans identify the species, do we know what the purpose of the trident is? I don't. I've never. It's a question. I think it may well be out there. It's probably in that book. It's not. I've not read every page, but um, I. As with a lot of these things, I mean, they're, they're a whole load of spines, which I can't tell you what they're for. There's a lot of defensive um, defensive spines, some offensive spines, which they do fight a little bit. Um, so the sort of combat weapons. So they're, they're quite often something like um, Licinius, which we will look at next week, you know, there, there are they're quite spiny, the um, Odielus, very, very spiny things, and the spines are everywhere. The fact that there aren't particular spines at the front on some and others, I'm, I'm not sure. That makes me think that why Odielus has big fat spines on, you know, the, the trident as opposed to thin pointy ones, I'm not sure. I would be inclined because pedipalps definitely have a copulatory 
um, sort of sexual function to them, I, I would assume that the, um, that the trident may well also be something that the male can hang on to. Um, there are a whole host of, you know, I haven't even gone into some of the pegs and, and structures that they use to hold on to the females first pair of legs sometimes when they're mating. And because they are sort of in that position, there's all sorts of ways that the male might use though that's that's those spines at the front to hold on but he's also got them so maybe it stops them from flexing from side to side when they're mating maybe he slips off without the perhaps their tridents interlock when they're mating i don't know i don't know there you go another research project for someone oh, there you go just dishing out phds go on go and do some research so I'm not quite sure, but um, I would I would imagine that it's it's, it's one that is either defensive or it's some something to do with the copulation process, and it's it's got some advantage to them, otherwise it wouldn't be there. Excellent. Okay, and 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 the reference that that book that um, that you that you waved just now that is it, that's in your um, your presentation, is it is it Paul? It is, yeah. It's it's um, Pinto de Rocha, Rocha, Machado, and Giribet, Gonzalo Giribet. Um, but yes, it's it's absolutely awesome. I mean, it's a great book. It's oh, it's just full of lovely charts like that <laughs> for all sorts of species around the world. So, well, yeah, that tells you what what countries you find these things in and what months of the year. Just that random page for as many species as they have the information. So it's just a complete synthesis of knowledge. And it's, it's really, it's really excellent. It costs you a bit, but it's very excellent. <laughs> but I'll yeah. to make sure we have that at the museum. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's, 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 it's worth, I mean, yeah, every museum should have it. Um, it's rather expensive for some small museum in fairness. But your library, you know, get a library into library loan. I think libraries do still exist out there. Okay. Okay. Well, um, I, I can't see that there's been any other questions um, in the chat. Um, is there any? Would anyone like to to ask a, a, a final question for Paul? Richard. I've got one. Uh, hi, Paul. Hi. Uh, when I first started out, uh, I was encountering lots of little small species in woodland, which I misidentified as Nalima. But when I actually found Nalima, I discovered there were probably Leo Bunham juveniles that I was misidentifying. Yeah. Is, is there a way of, sort of separating them out easily? No, um, not that I, I, I tell you what I, I would think, but I, I can't tell you that this is absolutely true. And that I used to think, I was always somewhat convinced that juvenile uh, Nalima had white knees. Um, so they had the sort of, the, the, the end of each um, sort of uh, article of the limbs. Uh, tended to be pale in the Lima juveniles. But I hadn't seen, I'm not, I don't see many juvenile Leobunums, to be honest. And, and certainly some of the big new species do have pale, um, pale legs. But I used to always think of Nalima as having white knees. Um, but I, I, it, it's not, that's not a, it's not foolproof by any means. Um, I think any of the juveniles like that, Nalima and Lebunum are quite are so closely related that uh, it, it's quite difficult. So, so the juveniles, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but I would say mostly the, the juvenile Lebunums have those sort of spotty appearances of the of the I showed Limbatum and species A. The Lebunums do tend to be more like that, and Nalima does tend to be more unicolor. Um, I'm not sure if, if 
I've not seen one for many a year. A juvenile Nilema may have the little orange dots on its coxa. Don't know, but I would have thought possibly not with a juvenile, but they have just a little dot of orange. Um, and yeah, there's not much else. I, 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 I don't want to encourage anybody to really do the juveniles. They're just a pain, really. <laughs> I think the thing is, I, I was thinking they were adult Nilema. No, so I mean, when you've got they're... adult Nilema, they're... As I, I haven't done it this week because I've split it into two, but I always finish with Nalima and say, Nalima is the one with no characters. Because Nalima has no distinguishing characteristics, which is in itself characteristic. So if well, you think something has no characteristics, it's Nalima. Yeah, and I it, and it, it my, my mistake <laughs> when I actually found an adult Nalima and thought, oh, yeah, I, I see it now. Yeah. But it yeah, was see. that. The yard key where it gives the size measurement of a femur or a leg. Oh, Look, yeah. A juvenile Leobunum keys out as an Alima. And I was thinking, right, yeah. Oh, hang on a minute. I've made a mistake here. <laughs> Quite. Right. Now it's, yeah, they're, they're, they're distinctive ish, but no, I, I, I don't like, I don't like putting a name to any of these juveniles really. I'm just never quite convinced. But you say, once you've seen some Nalims, it may be that they've all got white legs. I used to think they did, um, mm -hmm. but that's partly because I just don't see enough juvenile Leobunums. Mm. I should oh. sweep more in the, in the spring, and I don't. Uh, another observation I had about Sabacon is that I turned it up at the summit of a mountain in South Wales at 700 metres under rocks. Which is nice. It's quite, quite an unusual habitat, really. This, I've yeah. Seen up, I put that out a few I've only seen it at fairly low levels in, in leaf litter in woods. Um, I know a very nice Tesco's in Swansea where I can find it. Um, classic site there, very easy to park and find it. But um, now I'm not sure, it's in the wire forest somewhere and I don't know how, what the altitude is there. I should imagine that's probably fairly high up, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Is it thought to be another one of those introduced species because it seems a gradual... I would think spread. so. I mean, it, it seems, I think it is. Um, I, I don't, I've not read anything about that, but I, it makes sense. It, it started off in South Wales, really, you know, and it's, it's just spreading now. So I think it is, I think it, as a lot of them are introduced species. Sort of remembering back to your millipede and woodlouse course. About the... Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I don't know whether it's one that's specifically come in with the steel from the Pyrenees or not, but, you know, it could do. And the site I'm thinking of is, is very much railway sidings that used to be very industrial, that very you know, used to serve steelworks and, and, um, and, and collieries. So, yeah, it, it is potentially what we need to find is a is some we'll get Christian Owen to find us some um, new harvestmen, three or four new species to science while he's at it down there. That would be good. <laughs> um, I have had a I've had a route around and I've not seen any. But I've, I've also seen that Sabacon in natural caves in South Wales. Okay. They're really nice limestone caves and they're really deep in, right at the end. Okay. I wonder if it's just yeah it's just it, it it likes it just needs a bit of moisture I mean it, it's usually quite damp where you find it um but it it's um yeah just taking what it can what it can get I think and if it's at the top of a mountain it's clearly clearly gets about it's a very delicate little thing well, I was wondering whether it was being transported in the rocks that we're using for path repairs maybe yeah yeah way. possibly yeah long way yeah. to walk from a well, yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, no, I think, yeah, the ballast and uh, to repair footpaths is where most, most of the limestone loving plants of the, of the world have transported around, isn't it? Just take a few harvestmen with them. Yeah, Sabacon's just about got into North Wales now, so there's a chance it might turn up in Northwest England anytime. Yeah, yeah I, I, it could easily be in, the, in your area, Gary, so. It's a distinctive little beast. I do say, I mean, all along, I could just say, you know, they are. When I say there's one character, you need to know that it's a bit delicate. It's, it's you, know, you need to know it's a harvestman. But that club 
that boxing glove at the end of that's fine. That's that um, crown on the head. That's all you need to know. It's a great big thing. It's orange with black lights down the side. That's all you need to know with all of these things. I could have taken 10 minutes to go through the talk I've just did in an hour and a half. But, you know, I know you want a bit more, a bit more detail than that. But actually, that's Harvestman. They, they are pretty straightforward if you're confident. Next week, I'll talk about the ones where people go, oh, I'm not sure. Um, well, OK, there were a few in, those, in this week as well. But hopefully it should be reasonably short next week. We'll see. And I've said that before, no. <laughs> okay. Um, excellent. Has, was any any more questions from anyone? This last chance now, then, I think. Anybody? No. Okay. Well, I think. Well, all that's left really in, in the chat is a is a very long thread of compliments and thank yous, Paul. So. Oh. People are really clearly very much appreciating uh, your 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 seminar and all your knowledge sharing and uh, and I'm, and I know it's going to be uh, an amazing resource for for a lot more people on on YouTube as well going forward. So we're we're really grateful for all your efforts and and your time and your expertise in in sharing that. <laughs>